Hi, this is Misha, and in this video, we're going to be looking at the development history and some of the service history of the class of firearm we know today in the USA as the submachine gun. However, at different times and in different places, it has had other names. For example, machine pistol or machine carbine and many, many others. Now, I don't have full autos. It's not something I do. And I'm not a class three manufacturer or dealer. So all of these are semi-automatic, which is not gonna make this video probably as good as the smokeless powder or the evolution of the self-loading rifle because those are all original guns. But these are all guns that are authentic in the sense that they're either parts kit rebuilds or they're original semi-auto versions for Im that were imported. So I've done my best. I've also put display barrels in the ones that I had display barrels for. So, kind of get going here. And we'll try to splash up some pictures of the actual guns so you can see them too. Before World War I, the submachine gun did not exist. Heck, the self-loading pistol didn't really exist before World War I. I mean, uh, the Luger was adopted in 1908. The 1911 was adopted in 1911. Many nations went into World War I still equipped with revolvers for the most part. France, Italy, Russia, good examples. Germany still issued quite a few of the old Reichs revolvers. America had issued the, uh, the 1917. Britain definitely did the whole Webley thing. Mark V, Mark VI mostly. Now, all of these nations did have self-loading pistols, but a lot of them were in pretty light calibers, like 32, even some 25s. But of course, you started to see more and more 45s and 9mm as trench warfare really took hold and they saw what they needed, not what they thought they might need before the war began. Really the first efforts were converted pistols. We have a video on the history of the Luger and in it you'll see an artillery or so-called artillery, a, a long pistol, which was adopted in 1914. This is a Luger with a long barrel, eight inches, adjustable tangent sights, and a shoulder stock. Later on, in the beginning, it would have the standard eight round mag. Later on, it would be fit with a 32 round snail drum, firing nine millimeter. This was still a semi-automatic, but we do have a shoulder stock, we do have a longer barrel, and we do have a relatively large capacity. So that was not a submachine gun because it still fired in single shot, but it was one of the early predecessors and there were some experiments with doing uh, select fire Lugers. Another early one was the C96 Mauser, often known as the broom handle. It already had a pretty long barrel at five and a half inches. It fired quite a powerful cartridge, either being 7.62 or, excuse me, 7.63 or 9 millimeter, and it would come with a shoulder stock. Now, by default, it had a 10-round integral magazine topped off by stripper clips, but detachable mag versions were tried, and later on in its life, there would even be select fire versions of the broom handle. So these are kind of early predecessors. The first proto-submachine gun came from Italy, of all places. Developed in 1914 and 1915, it was called the Villa Perosa. We'll put up a picture. It was a linked double barrel weapon firing 9mm Glycenti, which was basically 9mm Luger but lighter loaded to fire in the 1910 Glycenti automatic, which was standard in Italy at the time. And originally it was made for aircraft. Had a high rate of fire because in, in air battles, you only had a few seconds and not even a whole, whole second a lot of the times to shoot at your enemy. So you wanted to get as many bullets on target as quickly as possible. So that's why this gun came to, into existence. 
and they chambered it for 9mm, a pistol round, because it was lightweight, amongst other things. It worked well for aircraft. And the aircraft of the day really didn't have armor, per se. They were wood and canvas, especially early in World War I. So they thought it would work, and it didn't really. It did see some issuance later on in the war by infantry, and it was never truly a submachine gun. It's a wild-looking critter, but it was kind of put into the role of a submachine gun. But it, what it did is it inspired. And what it inspired was Germany. They came up with the first true submachine gun to actually see field use. I know there are some rare prototypes and other things, but we're talking about actually went into production. This was the MP18 Bergman, designed by Schmeiser. I don't have one of those. If I ever find a parts kit, I'll definitely have it built up. I do have a gun on the couch that is quite close to it in some ways that we'll get to in just a minute. But the MP18 fired the 9mm cartridge, same as the Luger. It was a simple blowback gun with about an 8 inch barrel, had a more traditional wood stock, and it fed from the same snail drum mags, 32 round, of the artillery Luger. Now these mags were not ultra reliable, they were pretty bulky, but it's what Germany had so they went with it. It could also feed from standard Luger magazines. Not a whole lot were made before the end of World War I. But, German storm troops, raiding trenches especially, found it to be immensely effective. And it really displayed the submachine gun's use and utility in war. So much so that after the war, the Treaty of Versailles banned Germany from producing submachine guns. And this was the beginning. The MP stands for Maschine Pistol, Machine Pistol. And it was the first and really the only one to be filled in numbers in World War I. However, we get to our first gun on the couch. <clears throat> and I don't have the mags in these guys for, because of storage reasons. <laughs> It'd be hard to get all of everything on the couch with a mag in it. This is, as most everyone knows, the Thompson. Now this is a model 1928. This is a semi-auto, as I said. These all will be. Firing from a closed bolt. No bolt release on these critters. The Thompson did not go into service in World War I. However, its designer, Thompson, was working on it in 1918. And the first prototypes were ready at the end of the year. And these started to really appear in 1919. The first production models were put out by Colt as the Model 1921. And these are the so-called first-generation submachine guns. Now, when we get into generations, people can kind of argue this is a Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4. Everyone has their different systems. I'm basically going to divide things into four and a half generations, the, the most recent one we can kind of dispute, it's hard to say. But we're going to say four generations. This would be a generation one subgun. This fires 45 ACP, which was the standard handgun cartridge of the United States. We have a, an entirely milled receiver. It did fire originally from an open bolt, but it had a free-floating firing pin and very nice internals. The original 1921s even had nickeled internals for both corrosion resistance and smooth operation and frankly just to look sexy. As you see, we have a pistol grip. This has the more military style horizontal forend. A lot of them you see will have the, the second pistol grip at the front. We have a thinned barrel for cooling. This is the original length barrel. We just have an extended extension here with a cuts compensator to check recoil. We have very finely adjustable rear sights. Yeah. Lyman stock. Very well done firearms. Flipping it around. We are select fire. We have two controls here. 
safety and fire select. Last round hold open. These have a quick detaching buttstock, which was something of the day for storage. As you see, the buttstock is solid wood. These Generation 1 subguns were machined steel in wood. The, the Thompson would originally be made with this 20 round magazine. And a 50 round drum would be developed for it. Later on, a 30 round extended mag would come out. As well as a 100 round drum, which is ridiculous, but cool. And the U.S. military was pretty slow to adopt the Thompson. Most militaries after World War I were actually pretty, pretty slow to adopt submachine guns. The 1928 model would be used by the Marines, some in the 30s. And when World War, excuse me, when World War II would kick off, they would introduce the M1 and M1A1 models, which were simplified for mass production. Now this video is not going to go too much into detail about each of these guns and we'll be here for three hours. So that's why I'm kind of rushing through. We have individual videos on most if not all of these. But the Thompson would serve through World War II in one guise or the other. And it would even serve into Vietnam. And it would be purchased in some numbers by foreign nations. However, it was heavy and expensive to purchase and even to produce. So it kind of limited its uh, effectiveness and marketability. Plus the stocking I've always found was really odd. I see what he was going for here, but it always wants to slip off my shoulder and slip up because it's just a slick butt plate. Some checkering would have been really nice. I can't, I really like the Thompson, but I, some of its ergonomics are a little bizarre, but it was really one of the first, if not the first, of course. Now next up is what we're going to have to use to stand in. This is my British Lanchester. And this is essentially a British copy of the German MP28 Bergman. Now the MP28 was an updated version of the MP18. So this is the closest to an MP18 I have. The biggest change was that it, I found that mag, now this is a Sten mag but it'll do the job, the MP28 and of course the Lanchester later fed from a new type of straight magazine holding 32 cartridges. We want to point this out because this is a double stack single feed and this would be what was used in this gun and many later guns. It is often kind of derided today, but it was a vast improvement over the snail drum. The MP28 was produced in Germany during the interwar period. As I said, it was an improvement on the wartime design. And it was copied to greater or lesser extents such as this British one here, by a lot of nations. It was still a Generation 1 submachine gun with a milled receiver tube. So the barrel is completely enclosed by this ventilated shroud. The uh, British version has a mount for their standard bayonet. S straight wood stock, not folding. Opens the same way, adjustable sights. Not as heavy as the Thompson but still quite time consuming to mass produce. One thing I did forget to bring up, the Thompson mag, unlike the Bergman mag, is also a double stack, but it is a double feed as well. And again, it has a bolt hold open. The standard mag that'll appear in a lot of these guns does not. We'll get to that in a sec. Another very famous one in the US, it wasn't especially well known, where is my mag here, until the parts kits came in, was the Finnish Schwami, the KP-31.
designed by Emo Lottie from the 1920s through the early 1930s, Finland was relatively an early adopter of the submachine gun, and they put these into quite large, widespread production at Tikakoski, especially for a nation like Finland, who had only had independence for about a decade and a half. But they saw the usefulness of the subgun, relatively cheap to produce compared to rifles, very dependable, especially in the Arctic conditions they were operating in, and it allowed a single soldier to have increased firepower. They had their reasons. I mean, Russia was an aggressor next door, so... They definitely had their reasons. I'm trying to put that in backwards. I might be... No, just tight. There we go. So they adopted the Swami. We're still a Generation 1 subgun. Have a mach machined tube. Still have a standard rifle stock. Now the cocking system on this is interesting. I find it to be very ergonomic in a sense. Right where you can get to it. Your safety selector is up here. Today we probably wouldn't put one in the trigger guard, but back then it was quite common. Still have adjustable sights. This one has a quick change barrel. Let's flip this and the barrel just twists off at 90 degrees. This is the later version with a muzzle brake. Now normally the barrel would end here, but for reasons. But it does have a long heavy barrel, 12 inches, 12 and a half to 12 inches. So this is a very chunky gun. It's up there with the Thompson. But I don't think Finland was going for a submachine gun as we would think of it today. They were thinking more of a little rifle capable of good range and accuracy that happened to be firing a pistol cartridge and had a large capacity. Now speaking of capacities, this gun was one of the first, aside from the Thompson, to really be issued with drums in large numbers. The first drums were 40 rounds, but problematic. Later they would go to a 71 round drum, which was much more effective. They would also issue it with a 20 round box magazine. But that's a pretty low capacity for a gun that has a high rate of fire like this. By the way, this is still select fire. What they would do is this mag here, and when I was trying to pick a mag to bring out for each of these guns, I picked this one because it's just really neat. This is actually originally a Swedish design. This is the so-called coffin mag. It is a quad stack design, not a double. Still a single feed though. The single feed originally was because of the drums. It holds 50 rounds. It's a little thick, but it's really short for holding 50 rounds. So this actually held more than the original 40 round drum, obviously, mathematics. And it was cheaper to produce and it was more reliable than the drum. This was developed in Sweden for use with their M3739, which was a licensed produced version of the Suomi. And while it had issues, it was, a, it was an interesting mag, an interesting step forward. The biggest issue with this, if it got dented, it was out of service, it was a little complicated to clean and maintain, and you needed a loader to load it. There's no way to load this by hand. That's pretty much what Finland went to war with during the Winter War. They either had the 70 round drum or the 50 round quad stack. Mostly the 70 round drum originally. In the continuation war they would get more of the quad stacks. The more famous six, uh, excuse me, 36 round stick mag would come after the war. It would actually cause them to have to modify the gun to be able to feed from double stack double feed magazines because before it could only feed from single stacks. So this is kind of interesting. But kind of shows you the idea of the submachine gun in the early 30s was still a little machine gun or a little rifle with select fire capability. They weren't really thinking about being compact or lightweight yet. 
But Finland used the KP-31 for many, many decades, so it was a very effective gun for them. Found my right spot here, guys. Next up, we have this gun here. This is honestly one of my favorites just for uh, usability. See what this, that little dust cover about me popped for. There we go, my dust cover. There's a little dust cover, guys, that keeps it safe. This is the Italian Beretta MAB 38, and this is the A variant, 38A. This is really the last of the first generation submachine guns. You can look at its inspirations and where it came from. It has some lineage going back to the Beretta M M1830, which itself can be traced back to the Villa Perosa. This is kind of the final culmination of that whole series. And it's also kind of the final gasp of the um, full-length type gun. But it has some really neat features, and I really dislike how the conversion to semi occurred with this one. Just came out really well. We have a 12-inch barrel here, still with the shroud around it. This version does have the bayonet lug still. We have a cuts style compensator for recoil. We have a machined receiver tube, but it's noticeably lighter weight, thinner steel than on the Thompson or even the Suomi. So this gun is a little lighter. Actually, it's quite a bit lighter than the Suomi. Better balanced. Now, if you see, there's a cocking handle on the right side with a kind of a dust cover behind it to protect it. There's a groove there to keep anything from getting in. As I said, we have a dust cover on the magwell here. So they were really trying to make a gun that could really endure the elements because they were having a lot of combat in North Africa with these. We still have adjustable sights on this version. Still simple, reliable. The trigger system is unique. Instead of having a selector, forward trigger is for semi only. And the rear trigger would have been for full auto. The rear is actually ribbed, so you can tell by this feeling which trigger you're on. We have a trap door in the buttstock for a cleaning kit. And aside from just being considered one of the best guns designed by Italy of World War I or World War II, this gun is notable for its magazine. Set this in my lap for a sec. This uses a double stack, double feed magazine, which really would inspire a lot of guns after World War II because it was a really good mag. It was affordable to manufacture, very reliable, easy enough to load. It was a really good magazine. I would argue the first truly good submachine gun magazine to come along in the 30s. These are going to production in 1939 uh, but there were not a lot of takers, honestly. Like a lot of nations, Italy wasn't sure about the submachine gun. It really wasn't until 1941 that there were any purchase orders from the Italian military, and you didn't see a lot of 38s in the field until 42, 43. During the war, they would make several simplified versions, including the 3842 and 3844, which would go to more of the stamped receiver, and would really cross the line from Generation 1 submachine gun into Generation 2, which is what happened in World War II. With World War II, we will switch over to what's known as the Generation 2 submachine guns. And also, this would be the war where the submachine gun would really come into its own. It was the time when the submachine gun was produced in the tens of millions around Europe and even around the world, and it was used effectively in countless battles. And really kicking off the second generation of subguns was initially the German MP38, soon followed by the MP40, which I'm holding here. The second generation is really characterized by more and more stamped 
parts. Originally, the first would have still machined receivers, but these would be switched over to stamped folded receivers in the war. More and more of the other parts would be stamped. We would get away from fancy rear sights to just usually two to three position or even sometimes just one position. For example, on the MP40, we just have a flip up Hold down, so two notches total. We would also go to guns that were lighter weight. This has Bakelite furniture rather than wood. Most second generations will have some type of pistol grip, as this one does here. The MP38, MP40 series would be the first to really introduce an underfolding or any type of folding stock as a standard feature and this would become very ubiquitous later on in subguns. This one has a 10 inch barrel. That's pretty typical. As you remember a lot of the early guns would have 12 so we're getting a little shorter on the barrel. The idea, because we're getting into World War II, they figured out the submachine gun was useful but they didn't have time to make nice guns like the Thompson or MP28 Suomi, the MAB-38 even. They needed to crank these suckers out as quick as they could and they needed to have them require as little steel as possible and they needed to be able to be turned out by as unskilled, untrained, quickly trained workers as possible because many men were at the front. Stamped steel is obviously more effective at conserving steel than machining it. And once you get the, the stamping dies and all that down, it, it's, it's very cost effective. The initial setup is actually pretty expensive to do stamped guns. But once that's done, the per unit cost is very low. So the MP38 and then soon the MP40 would herald in this new age. And this is a very iconic submachine gun for anyone into World War II type activities. These guns, in addition to being cheaper, the idea was to make them more compact. As you see, this is much smaller than earlier guns and lighter. By today's standards, this is a pretty heavy gun, but by the standards of the day, it was pretty you know, reasonably light. That's because the role of the subgun was changing. Instead of being a trench warfare, open field type gun, the idea was more urban combat, CQB, special operations, it just, you know, more with structures and stuff around. There was a lot of house-to-house -house fighting in World War II. There was also more and more armored vehicles in World War II. And these guns were great for using in an armored vehicle because you could fold it up and not bang it around. And this one even has this bar on the underside of the barrel to rest against the side of an armored vehicle on the top. So, these guns would go into mass production in Germany and be very, very iconic. One interesting thing though, this is still using the same double stack, double feed, uh, single feed, 32 round mag really adopted for use in the MP28. And then of course copied by the British for the Lanchester. So the magazine was the shortcoming. Again, this was a better mag than the snail mag, of course, faster, easier to load, but the single feed would give problems. So that's really kind of one of the leftovers from earlier German subgun designs in the MP series. This gun has a lot of neat features and we have a full video on it for sure but very iconic gun and really the MP38 and MP40 are very similar it's just the MP40 was even further streamlined and cheapened up for mass production compared to the MP38 but that said the MP38 was quite affordable to produce compared to what had been out earlier set this back another very iconic SMG of the, I hate slings right this second, <laughs> the early part of the war. This is this here. This is the Soviet Russian P-51 
PPSH41. And this is an interesting gun. It is technically a second generation, but in, in its design, in its shape, it, it harkens back to the first. Now, Russia would get in to the submachine gun production itself with the PPD, first 34, then 34, 38, and then finally the PPD 40, which was a copy of the MP28 Bergman. That gun was highly influential in the 30s for people making their own submachine gun designs. Japan also copied it with its Type 100. But the PPD wasn't cheap enough for mass production. It had some issues that came to light during the Winter War. So the PPSH replaced it in 1941. And they would produce these in huge numbers in Russia. These were very easy to produce. While this looks like a Generation 1, it is built with mostly stamped parts. We have a simple flip rear sight, not a fancy ladder. Very simple construction, very simple stamped barrel shroud. We have, it even acts as a very simple muzzle compensator in the front. Obviously this is a semi-auto. It has a 16 inch extended barrel. It does have the original barrel here, which is about 10 and a half inches, so we're getting shorter. This would also be one of the first sub guns to feature chrome lining for better cleaning and resistance in the field. Now, the, <clears throat> excuse me, this fires 762-25 Tokarev, which was the standard in Soviet Russia since the early 1930s. It was a very good cartridge for a longer barrel sub gun because of its extra velocity and power. It's just shy of being a true magnum round. So this is all stamped. We are still select fire, which is again kind of a feature. Oh, I didn't mention, I apologize. On the MP38, MP40, we went to just a full auto only gun. Whereas before we were mostly always select fire on sub guns. My mistake there, guys. Sorry about that. This is still select fire though. And we still have a wooden stock with a cleaning kit compartment, which is, again, a little bit of a uh, kind of throwback to the Gen 1. And a neat folding mag catch. We are still kind of using the double stack single feed pattern. This is the later 36 round magazine. Originally, this gun would be issued with a 71 round drum, which was basically a copy, although they're not the same, they're not interchangeable, of the Suomi 70 round drum. After the winter, winter war in Finland, the Russians saw the, the, the intelligence of the Suomi's mag design, but the drums weren't as reliable, were heavy, were slower to load, were more expensive to produce, so they quickly went to this stick mag in 1942 and usually they would issue a few of these in one drum so the soldier would have a drum for uh, needing a lot of firepower at once but you know you only need two stick mags to have the same firepower or more so than the drum so not a bad deal they would equip entire I mean, just entire squadrons with these they, they would use them to do mop up operations in World War II uh, they were a great equalizer. Russia really learned to respect the submachine gun. As it gave its soldiers firepower. It's kind of analogous to how the Finns did in the Winter War against Russians. Well, now the Ru Russians learned that trick and did the same against the invading Germans. So the submachine gun was very important in Russia in World War II. Now here, let me look for my mag for this one. Here we go. Here we go. And then this is probably next to the MP40, the most iconic subgun of World War II. This is the British Sten. Now the British called these machine carbines. 
Sorry, hang up on the mag there a bit. Boop. This is a Mark III. This is about as simple as the Sten ever got during World War II. Britain, as with so many others, was not terribly interested in submachine guns in the 20s and 30s. When they felt they needed some, they would just purchase Thompson's, getting them in 1940. However, Germany was steamrolling through Europe, and after the Battle of Dunkirk, they were really short on weapons. France had uh, basically fallen and was, was out of the action. They got scared, and they needed guns, and they needed them quickly, and the bolt-action infield was still the standard issue. They had not been working on a self-loading infantry rifle either. Originally, they would do the Lanchester over here, just a straight copy of the Bergman with a few changes to suit British taste. That would be produced at the Sterling factory, but it was a stopgap measure, really. It was too expensive, too time-consuming, and needed you know, wood and machine steel. They needed something cheap, cheap, cheap. So in 1941, the Sten Mark I was researched, developed, and quickly adopted. The idea behind the Sten, make a gun as cheap as possible, using as many off-the-shelf parts as possible, and as few machined parts and as many stamped parts as possible. In the end, with the Mark III here, the only real machined parts were the bolt, the trunnion, and the barrel. Pretty much everything else was stamped. The original Mark I was a little fancier, had some wood on it, had a very basic uh, compensator to check muzzle rise. But really, in the details, the Mark I and the Mark III are very similar because they both have fixed barrels. They have an extended receiver tube coming out here. And even then, they're both basically just super simplified Lanchesters because these are just open bolt blowback guns. Even the Mark III used a stamped receiver tube rather than like with the Mark II and I, which had a machined tube. It was a very basic tube, basically a piece of plumbing. The, uh, the Mark III had a piece of steel sheet that was rolled over and welded at a seam at the top. Simple fixed stamped sights, nothing fancy there. They are not adjustable. It does have one embellishment. It is still select fire. Selector here, although the selectors didn't always work as intended. We had a few different stocks that appeared on these. These are not folding, but they are quick detaching. So for storage, you just push this in and the stock just slides down and off. This one's being a little ornery, being stuck on there a bit. I kind of stuck it on because it was loose before. But um, the stock, you just press in here and slide it down and off on a dovetail. So while they didn't go to a folding stock, they did make a quick detachable stock which compacts the gun. Now, if this was a original gun, the barrel would end about here, making this quite small. And on versions like the Mark II and the Mark V, the barrel pulls out and this magwell rotates down. I chose the Mark III because it's the closest to the Mark I that I have, and also because it's as simple as the gun became in the middle of World War II. The Sten is famous, even infamous. It was used by pretty much every allied and commonwealth nation during and after World War II. Saw a lot of use in Korea as well. It fires 9mm just like the German guns because again we're kind of copying. And this is when 9mm entered the British military as standard issue even though they were still using Webley revolvers first in 455 and then soon in uh, 38. The mag though as you saw earlier the Sten mag is basically the same as an MP40 mag, double stack, single feed, because they both were developed from the MP28, so they have a common ancestor there. And this was the big fault of all these guns. This magazine pattern just didn't work super, super fantastic, unfortunately. So much so that some of these mags were blocked to only 20 rounds, making them a single stack, single feed, and these would work better. You'll see a lot of these after the war where they'll change the mags from 32 rounds to, uh, to 20. But the, the good old Sten, and we of course got a good long video on this, is 
really what exemplifies, what typifies the Generation 2 submachine gun. Very inexpensive, very quick to produce, lightweight, very small, compact, especially the Mark II version. And they saw a lot of use. And again, it was a force multiplier, we could say, by modern lingo. It gave the British soldier a machine gun instead of a bolt action, allowing them to defend the island and eventually retake Europe. So they were able to give cheap little machine guns firing a reasonably effective pistol caliber. This has an 8-inch barrel, as pretty much all Stens did. And this is at a time before body armor, of course, guys. So keep this in mind. I mean, 9mm, 45, it was fine. And certainly 7.62 Tokarev was perfectly fine as a close to medium range gun. So the Sten. I mean, it's just part of it. <laughs> oh, and these really didn't have much of a safety at this point. They've pretty much gone away from safeties. Cocking back here, we've got a notch to hold the bolt back. That's pretty much our safety on this. Before this time, all the other guns had something. Now the MP3840 was pretty much in the same boat, with just a bolt lock back, and this would lead to problems later. We'll get to. Another very iconic gun is the Russian PPS-43. Very definitively a second generation submachine gun. This was developed not just during, but literally in the invasion and siege of Leningrad, 1942, Bespasian. It still fires 762 by 25. We have a slightly shorter barrel at 10 inches, a very simple muzzle compensator. Simple barrel shroud that doesn't completely enclose it, just stamped on. Stamped receiver. We are just full auto only, not select fire. Simple rear flip sight. Top folding, metal butt stock. Kind of like the MP40, but in reverse. This one's a pistol, so the stock is welded closed, but it's still there. We have a pistol grip made out of Bakelite, just like the uh, MP40. We can use the magwell here as a grip, which is the intention. Simple, simple blowback gun. Just simple as they get. One improvement that the PPS series had over the PPSH, we're using a double stack, double feed magazine again, holding 35 rounds. These were more reliable than the PPSH-41 magazines. The only downside, that meant the mags were not interchangeable and these could not feed from drums. But really by 1942, 1943, people were getting a little disillusioned with drums. You don't really see drum magazines getting developed during and after World War II. That was kind of a pre-war notion. It, they just didn't work out as effectively. These guns were extremely fast and inexpensive to produce, just like the Sten was for the British. The Russians thought the PPSH-41 was a good gun but could be made cheaper, so they designed this. Now this was never meant to completely replace the PPSH-41. This was meant to supplement it. The PPSH-41 was more of a battlefield submachine gun. This was more of an urban combat, recon, special operations type gun. It's more compact, it's lighter, and yes, as I said, it's cheaper to produce. They wouldn't produce near as many of these as the PPSH-41, but of course these came out much later. But they would produce enough, and they would stay in service in Russia until the 60s, along with the PPSH. And they would be copied by many nations, including Poland, which this one is a semi-automatic from. And it's just a really neat, interesting subgun. And again, with the Sten gun, exemplifies the Generation 2 theory. Cheap, fast to produce. There's basically no machine parts on this thing. It's all stamping. 
except for the barrel, the bolt. And it's interesting because this is their first major effort at a mass production fully stamped gun, which uh, would lead to some interesting results after World War II. Very simple stampings, but stampings nonetheless. And that's about as simple as the submachine gun got in World War II. There was also the American M3 grease gun, which I do not have an example of. I did own one of the Valkyries at one time. It was essentially an American Sten in a lot of ways, stamped, welded steel, firing 45 ACP. Got an inch in the grease gun. Maybe one day I'll pick up another one. The Thompson, as I said, there was the M1 version, which was greatly simplified, but still on a milled receiver, so it's still technically a Generation 1, even though it's being, being made in the war. Germany would keep making the MP40. They would also introduce a version known as the MP3008, which was basically a Sten copy, but with, with, the, with a vertical magazine well, rather than um, a horizontal. So if you can't beat them, join them. It was cheap enough. They were able to crank out a large number even at the end of the war. As I said, Japan did the Type 100 and they did simplify it. It was based on the Bergman, so Generation 1, but they managed to simplify it in World War II, but they did not produce that many. And in Finland, they would actually reverse engineer the PPS-43, creating the KP-44, which looks very similar, except it feeds from standard Suomi magazines and drums. But these were not in service until after the war. The submachine gun was produced, as I said, in very large numbers up until 1945 and saw a lot of use on all sides of the war. The most common caliber by far was 9mm, but quite a few 45 guns from America were scattered here and there from everywhere. It was dependable, easy to train soldiers on, light compared to most infantry guns, certainly light compared to the standard machine guns of the day. And after the war, the submachine gun would not disappear. After World War II, necessarily, submachine gun production would slow down, even development would slow. Part of the reason, of course, we have all these guns left over from the war, so we don't really need new ones, and we've pretty much made the gun as cheap and simple and fast to make as possible. But what we haven't done is make it as ergonomic, user-friendly, and later on modern as possible. And most importantly, safe as possible. World War II era Generation II submachine guns really had a problem with uh, safety. If you dropped them because they were open bolt, sometimes they would just spring back just enough to catch a cartridge, but not enough to get caught by the sear, go forward and have runaway fires. Also, worn sears could do this. We didn't have many manual safeties. We didn't have uh, much else. Now, it, towards the end of the war, you would see different methods to try to make these guns safer, including bolt handles that could be locked into the receiver wall. You also saw, like on the MP40, some kind of uh, covers to go. But as uh, the war went on, this was known as a, this was a problem. Now, one gun that was in development during World War II, but did not go into production until afterwards, was this guy here. This is the Swedish M45. This is the D variant, but they had uh, A, B, C, D variants. And these would be produced at Carl Gustav. I know it doesn't look like it, but basically this is a very nicely done Sten gun. But, you know, that kind of traces all the way back to the Bergman instead. Now remember, Carl Gustav had been making the Suomi under license before and during World War II. But they needed something faster, cheaper, more compact to produce. So they come up with this guy. The barrel and all that is very similar to a Suomi. It quick detaches by unscrewing this here. We're at 8 inches, so a little shorter than the Suomi. Actually quite a bit, 4 inches. It's a pretty heavy profile barrel. We have an adjustable front sight, protected. 
we have a three position flip rear. Dit, dit. Farm. So fancier sight. Still a simple blowback gun with a notch like on a Sten. The magwell is interesting on these, and as is the magazine. This is a well that was added later in the 50s. Originally, these would feed from the standard Suomi mags, so they were double stack, single feed. They would feed from the coffin mags. But then they would soon develop this magazine here. Sorry, this one's a little stiff. This is probably one of the best submachine gun magazines made. This is a 36 round stick mag, double feed, double, actually double feed, double stack. What's interesting, it has a trapezoidal shape to guide the nine millimeter bullets. This was really necessary because of the guns originally being single feed, but it was a way around it to kind of make a single feed gun into a double feed getting into the chamber. These were extremely reliable, light, inexpensive to produce, and just very effective. The early guns would have this magwell removable, so you could still either use these or the original coffin mags. Later on, they would rivet the magwell in when they were only issuing the stick mags. The Swedish K, as it became known, is most popular in America because of the Vietnam War. Oh, a few other features before I get too distracted. We do have this stock. The stock is stiff, but you just fold it over. Stiff is good. You don't want something that will come wiggly on you. Folds up. Very simple tubular steel. To deploy, just grab. So it deploys very quickly. Locks very securely. We even have a rubber cheek piece. So you're not putting your cheek against steel. And large trigger guard. Very large grips, wood panel. Some of these were select fire only. Some, excuse me, some of these were full auto only. Some like this were originally select fire. This is now just a dummy selector. So they started to reintroduce select fire capability. And just more refinement started to come back into the submachine gun. Also better ergonomics and sights. A gun like this is probably still technically a generation two, but it's going to herald in the next generation three. Transitional gun, if you will. They would produce these throughout the 50s into the 60s, and they would be standard issue in Sweden into the 90s. They, they were in, in really, the last ones weren't retired out until after the turn of the millennium. Still firing nine millimeter, as most would be. Just a simple, dependable submachine gun, but with some more refinements than would appear on the wartime guns. Another famous submachine gun that came out right after the war is this one here. This is the French Mat 49. Now, Again, this is a simple blowback gun, firing 9mm, nothing too special there. But it was France's attempt to replace a bunch of submachine guns that had been in service before and during World War II with a standard gun. Now like a Generation 2, these were supposed to be cheap and easy to mass produce. But getting into the Generation 3, we're introducing more safety features and more ergonomics. One neat feature is this hinge down magwell for storage, which then doubles as a grip. This even lets you keep a magazine in it. So if you have it up, your magazine is completely disconnected from the gun. It cannot load and fire accidentally. So that's a good safety feature. We also have a grip safety back here so the gun can't fire unless that's depressed. We have quite a compact barrel with the half length shroud. Still a pretty simple rear flip peep but adequate enough. 
We have a stamped receiver, but it's actually a square stamped receiver, not the simple tube. So a little more ornate. This was also good for reliability. It gave more crevices, more areas for dirt and debris to get into and not jam up the bolt. And by get into, I mean instead of being on a tube where if it's there, it's gonna there's nowhere for it to, the bolt to push it, so it's gonna jam up. In this, it can be pushed away from the bolt into one of the corners and then cleaned out later. It also has a dust cover here to cover the action. Normally on a full auto this would be spring loaded but because of the semi it needed to be. It has another sliding dust cover very similar to what we saw on the Italian gun here protecting this slot for the cocking handle. This is a pistol. It would have had a retractable wire stock and what's interesting about it, it was one of the earliest adjustable retracting stocks. It had three positions. And the way it was made, you could have cut as many positions as you wanted into it by just cutting uh, half moons into the uh, wire. This is a full auto only. Although they did have some select fire versions that used a double trigger system like the Beretta. Early guns would have wood grips. Later they would go to Bakelite. And even later they would just go to press steel. So they were trying to make these cheap. And they made a surprisingly large number from the 50s through the 60s. These guns saw extensive combat in Vietnam, Algeria, Morocco, and elsewhere. And that's why I included it, because it's one of the most used submachine guns post-World War II. And France, unlike a lot of nations, was very eager to adopt a submachine gun because they didn't have a, a, a good one to, to go with. They had a hodgepodge and they wanted to get rid of it. Whereas America and Britain and Russia had tons of them and didn't really need more, so they were very slow to develop new ones. But France was not because they really felt they needed one. These are used by commandos and paratroopers for the most part. But an interesting gun. Oh, the magazine. The magazine is interesting on this critter. Pop it back down for you guys. Because we're using a Sten gun style mag. Double feed. Excuse me, I'm sorry guys, I'm getting tired. I've been talking for a while now, so forgive me. Double stack, single feed, which ha should have the problems of all the MP40 stents, but it really does not because the way they designed it, it's very generous in the tolerances. It's oversized in pretty much every dimension. This allows more flexibility, makes it easier to load. This is probably the best of the single feed type mags to be adopted. These actually worked quite well but they are larger and a little heavier. And I think the reason they went with that was because of this whole folding mechanism. The single feed was easier to make it work with that. Another gun that's quite famous today is the British Sterling. L2A3. And much like with the Gustav, this is essentially a really nice Sten gun. And one of, if not the best, submachine gun designs of the Cold War. The Sten gun was a wartime emergency measure. So it had Admittedly, from the very beginning, they knew it had shortcomings and, and drawbacks, but they produced it. During the war, though, towards the end, 1944, a gentleman by the name of Patchett designed an enhanced submachine gun, and he worked for the Sterling factory, which had been producing the Lanchester early in the war. He designed, essentially, a nice Sten. It was tested a bit during the war, but the war ended before it was really necessary, and since they had so many stins in inventory, it got put on the back shelf. It went through many, many tests and was updated and refined throughout the 40s and was officially adopted as the L2A1 
1951, I believe. If it wasn't, that's 53, guys. Anyway, early 50s. And a few updated versions is the L2A2 and the L2A3 were adopted, with the final version coming out in 57, and that, that would be the iconic version. Internally, again, we still just have a simple blowback gun, but we're adding refinements back to the submachine gun. And this is probably the quintessential Generation 3 in Britain, with the Lanchester and, and Thompson in service being the Gen 1, Sten's, all the marks being Gen 2, and this being the Gen 3. This would have an 8-inch barrel, ending about here normally. I've got a shroud on it for me and now. So same as the Sten there. We have better sights. We have a drift adjustable front that's protected. We have a flip rear peep now, not just a simple notch. Still just a blowback design, still have a barrel shroud. We do have a bayonet lug. We have a fixed side mag well. We finally have a true pistol grip. The Sten Mark V tried out a pistol grip and it worked okay, but this one was actually designed into the gun and it flows much better. We also have an improved trigger, and these were select fire with a very ergonomic selector. On the semi, of course, this is just safe and semi, but it would go further to full on a military gun, of course. We have a bolt with helical cuts in it. And this was to push dirt and debris out of the action as it moved. And this was very reliable. We also have added safety features. Again, we have a manual safety to start. We also have a floating firing pin as opposed to just the simple firing pin mounted on the bolt face of the Sten in most of the World War II guns. We've gone back to the floating firing pin as on the, um, the pre-war Generation 1 guns, and this added extra safety because it would not line up with the cartridge unless the bolt was fully forward. Another thing that really helped with the reliability on the Sterling was its fantastic magazine. This is the one mag that would rival the Suomi mag for best submachine gun magazine post-war. The only reason that I wouldn't say this one's categorically better, it was much more expensive to produce than the Suomi. We have four, uh, 34 rounds, double stack, double feed, but they went a step further and put two rollers instead of a simple stamp follower in here. And we even have a round coil spring as opposed to a square one. So after the experiences of the Sten mag, they weren't taking chances. They, they went whole hog with the magazine making the Rolls Royce of submachine gun magazines for this gun. Another final feature, we have a true underfolding stock. Now this stock is pretty complicated to fold and unfold because it wasn't meant for a quick deployment or stowage. It was just meant for transport and to keep the gun as compact as possible. So you can get quite good at folding and unfolding it, but it wasn't meant to be done in a hurry like for on a PD PDW. As I said, Britain would field these in the late 50s and through the 60s, and they would replace the Sten guns, and they would remain in active service throughout the first Gulf War, and then slowly be replaced as more and more of the L85 bullpup came into service. Still firing 9mm, yada yada. It really is just a really nice Sten gun in a lot of ways, but one of the neatest submachine guns, and really the one that got me into submachine guns, even collecting these semi-autos. Another one that got me into collecting semis, of course, is a gun that basically needs no introduction. It is rarely Uzi. The Uzi is another solidly third generation sub gun. It was really the first gun to be designed in Israel to go into mass production. And 
since it, the Israelis, since the IDF, have been using Sten guns and MP40s, they learn lessons. This gun is, one, built tough. It's built to endure the desert. And it's built to be very soldier-friendly and soldier-proof. Because there are some long ranges in Israel, we have a 10-inch barrel still. It is quick detachable, though. Unscrews. We have quite good sights. We have a adjustable front post that's protected and a flip rear peep that's protected. We have this iconic talk cocking action. Of course, these still fired from the open bolt. We have a bayonet lug, like on the sterling there. This takes its, its own bayonet, but it's kind of patterned after the Mauser. It's very close to a Mauser bayonet. This is made from stamped metal. We have a square-shaped receiver, much like on the French Mat 49, but this whole top cover removes so that it's only a U-shaped piece. We have grooves stamped into it for strength all around. This was select fire, of course. Some auto, we just have safe and semi. On a full auto, we would go further forward for full auto. Have a reasonably good pistol grip. We have a lot of safety features built in. We have the grip safety here. We have the manual safety we just looked at. On a military open bolt, we would also have a ratcheting top cover which will make a click every couple of millimeters and not allow the bolt to go forward until it's fully back. So yet another safety. So they really learn their lessons with the Sten. Another innovative feature was the magazine. We have a well-placed mag release here. Reach up, grab your hand. It's the whole hand finds hand thing. The original mags were 25 rounds. They would also make 20 and 32 later. This is a double stack, double feed. And it's very close, where did I set it? To the, that, uh, and we'll look at it in a bit, to that Beretta mag. Now look for it in a bit. But it is based on the Beretta MAB 38 magazine, because it worked. It was one of the best magazine designs before and during World War II. And that's what helped the Uzi be reliable. Early on, we would have detachable wood shoulder stock for storage. Then in the 60s, they would introduce a underfolding metal stock, which is now very iconic. I've kind of made this one intentionally tight because I don't like wiggle. <laughs> Most of them you see will have the underfolding stock because it came, became more and more common. But earlier it would have the wood. And these would be used in very large numbers in Israel starting in 1956 and they would have very good success exporting them all over the world, even selling manufacturing licenses. This was the most successful submachine gun of the post-war period because it was a clear upgrade to all the wartime guns. And when they started to hit the market in the late 50s, early 60s, a lot of the wartime guns were wearing out. Nations were needing new ones. And this, the Uzi came at the right place in the right time. It would serve in the IDF up into the 80s and standard and then kind of be slowly phased out by more, more modern guns. But you could still find some Uzis throughout the 90s, of course. Interestingly, West Germany would adopt this as the MP2, the West German Bundeswehr. After the Uzi and the Sterling, some machine gun development kind of slowed yet again. As I said, World War II was its heyday. 
After the war, it was slow. Then after a lot of guns wore out, they needed more. But then after those first few guns, there wasn't a large need. We'll get into why in just a minute, um, most of you know anyway. But of course, there was the HK MP5. The MP5 was part of the HK family. The full-size G3 fired 7.62 NATO. Then you had the HK33 firing 5.56 NATO. And then you had the MP5 firing 9mm. And it is a scaled down HK33, which is itself a scaled down HKG3. These are all different in the sense that they have, I mean, they're all, they're all the same with each other, excuse me, but they're different from a lot of previous guns because we have a roller delay system. Now, in the 308, the 762, you really need this because of the cartridge. It's unique, though, for a 9mm to have a locked breech. Now, roller delay isn't a true locked breech. It is literally a delay. The MP5 was unique in submachine guns because it fired from a closed bolt and the bolt was semi-locked to the trunnion. This gave greater accuracy. It did come at the cost of cooling and rate of fire, but that was a trade-off they were, they were happy to make, and it, it proved to be a wise one. It wasn't the first closed bolt submachine gun, but one could argue it was the first truly successful closed bolt submachine gun. It was, of course, select fire. And it was really what changed from generation three to generation four and this is kind of getting to my own definitions here so feel free to disagree i'm just trying to kind of give it out these started to first appear in 1966 in an early form and really came onto the market in the 1970s and that's where the form like this appears we have a barrel about eight and a half inches long usually threaded or with this three lug or with both we have a fixed front hooded sight. We have a very adjustable diopter peep rear. We have a mount for a scope rail on the top. This gun is still made from stamped and welded steel, but it's more contoured and curved. It's also more ergonomic. This is one of the first times they tried to make a machine gun really fit the user. We have a different, this is the typical wide hand guard. There's all kinds of different ones available. Same for the pistol grip. This is the grooved grip with the metal housing, but there's many different available. This is the A2 fixed buttstock with a nice comb to it. We have well-placed safety control here. We have a paddle mag release, which is easy to use with either hand. And really, that's another thing. This gun is highly modular. This stock, this handguard, this lower pack pop off with just push pins. So you can put a different stock on. You can easily customize and configure the MP5 in the field for different needs. HK would target more police and special forces type customers for this, not general military use. Because by the 70s, militaries weren't using submachine guns in the millions as they had done in World War II, or even in the hundreds upon hundreds of thousands in Korea and Vietnam. So the HK MP5 really did herald in the second, excuse me, the fourth generation, and it was for somewhat of a different role very customizable, more attempts at ergonomics, a more of a focus on accurate fire than just uh, a bullet hose because of its different role. Some of these are still in service today as a testament to their effectiveness. And this was part of a rifle family, keep in mind. So it was a scaled down version of a larger parent rifle. And that leads to the next gun here. The 
the Colt, simply titled the 9mm submachine gun. This was developed at Colt throughout the 1980s and would first appear around 85, 86. This is basically, at least externally, nothing more than Colt's M16 carbine reworked to fire 9mm, like the MP5, it fires from a closed bolt. However, it's not a locking system. It's, we're back to just a straight blowback, although we have a heavy buffer in it. We do have a bolt hold open, which is something we haven't seen in submachine guns much since the days of the Thompson. We have the same controls you're all accustomed to on an AR-15. We have A1 pattern or sights have a gas deflector here. We have a shorter port door. These almost always had the sliding stock. Early would have two position, later would have four. The original guns would have a 10 and a half inch barrel. Standard AR-15 controls. And these would feed from magazines inspired by the Uzi, but not the same. As I said, the Uzi mag was a very good mag. This is a 32 round. They also do 25s quite commonly. These are very similar to an Uzi with a few changes. For one, we don't have the protrusions, the nipples on each side, which would keep it from going too far into the Uzi magwell because we need that with the AR magwell is different. We also have a different mag cut out here to work with the AR-15 style mag release. And most importantly, we have a catch in the back to work with the bolt hold open of this gun. And this, like the MP5, is part of the fourth generation because it's a scaled down, not really scaled down, it's actually the same size as the carbine, but it's a 9mm version of a parent rifle. It was also mostly targeted at police users, although some militaries, including the US Marines, did purchase these, and the Department of Energy used a different version, shorter, more compact. So there were some government military purchases, most of these were appreciated for having the same manual of arms as the M16 and later M4. And these are still in production today. And as I said, a solidly fourth generation submachine gun. And for our last rifle today, we have what we could argue to be a fifth generation Although really it's just a rework of the fourth using different materials. I thought this was an example. This is the CZ Evo 3 Scorpion. This is made in the Czech Republic. And this is one of the few truly modern submachine gun designs. It fires from a closed bolt even in the full auto versions. We have a bolt hold open like on the Colt. Ambidextrous mag release. Ambidextrous safety. Removable pistol grip that's modular and can be adjusted. Newer guns like this will of course have rails because everything today does. This forearm is also modular and can be removed. These sights are mounted to the rail and can be moved. Four position peep, adjustable front with protection. Most of you know the Scorpion, it's quite popular today. We have about an eight inch barrel with a removable muzzle device. 
And most notably for these newer guns, aside from the ergonomics and rails, we have a polymer body now. The bolt is still, of course, metal, but newer guns have polymer, of course, because it's the modern construction. This really began in the very late 90s, early 2000s with the, with the HK UMP, which was their attempt to modernize the MP5. It's a different operating system. It's no longer a roller delay, but it did use a polymer body, and it started to introduce more modular features for the submachine gun. These are faster, easier, cheaper, and modern standards to produce. They are also lighter, more weather resistant, you can have neat features like this folding stock to make it very compact. This also it has three adjustment positions. Most of these will. It's also quick detaching. Just press in on this button and it slides off a dovetail. So kind of like the old uh, Sten gun. And it feeds from polymer translucent curved mags. Kind of similar to an MP5 mag, except it activates a bolt hold open. Very lightweight, inexpensive to produce and purchase. They make these in 20 as well. And this is really one of the most up-to-date, true submachine gun designs. They were still firing 9mm, which is a standard NATO round these days. It's one of the very few to come out in the 21st century. Now, guys, I'm excluding PDW-type guns and little defensive pistols. For example, the Uzi Pro or the P90. That's a different class that really kind of split off from submachine guns in the 80s and 90s. Plus, my couch is only so big. And this video is already long enough. So... We've kind of looked at a brief yeah, overview of how the submachine gun has progressed all the way back from World War I with the Villa Perosa, then MP18 Bergman, and then the Thompson, which came out right after the war. We go through the Middle War period with the MP28 and the Suomi, and then right before the war we see things like the Beretta, 38A. During the World War II, we have lots of submachine guns, MP38, MP40, PPS H41, PPS43, the Lanchester, many versions of the Sten, <laughs> and so on and so forth. After the war, of course, we have some guns like the Gustav and the Mat 49 that came out in the 40s, but really pretty quiet. 50s, we pretty much are dominated by the Uzi. We get into the 70s, we have the MP5. We also have some guns like the Ingram Mac 10, Mac 11, but these were never really used by militaries in any numbers. They're mostly civilian or whatever guns, so I, and they're basically just uh, versions of the Uzi made a little cheaper. We get into the 80s, we're seeing a really big fallout and no real new submachine gun designs. Even this Colt was really kind of an afterthought. And this is because of the assault rifle, of course. And we have videos on that. But the assault rifle really replaced the submachine gun, especially as we saw more compact ones. Early assault rifles like the original AK, the FAL, the G3, were still quite big and bulky. In fact, the last two are really considered battle rifles. But as we get into things like the AKM, the M16, the HK33, we get a gun that is the same size and basically the same weight as a submachine gun, but it's firing the full power cartridge, or at least the intermediate power cartridge of the day. It has the same parts interoperability with the standard rifle. A good example is the XM-177 in Vietnam. We had the M16A1 as a full rifle, fine, but instead of using more submachine guns, they ended up using the compact version, the, the CAR-15 version. And this happened throughout most militaries. So by the 80s, you have smaller carbine or even sub-carbine versions of assault rifles 
being used where previously a submachine gun would have been used. This is especially true in urban warfare, house-to-house, -house, close quarter fighting. And this is actually why you see more PDW start to appear, because it fills a slightly different role. One of the earliest versions of it might be considered the, uh, the VZ-61 Scorpion. So we'll do a, probably a different video looking at that class of guns because it was more of a defensive pr protection weapon, whereas in the beginning, the submachine gun was an assault weapon. It was an offensive weapon. But over the years, it transitioned more to a defensive weapon, and that's kind of what ended. It's really remarkable that the EVO 3 has been as successful as it has because it's really up against some stiff competition. Before we go, I wanted to just lay all the magazines out side by side because the magazine is a very important part of the submachine gun. And its evolution is quite interesting, at least to me, but then again, I'm a nerd. This is the original Thompson mag, double stack, double feed in 45, with a bolt hold open. Very advanced for its day. As I said, the MP18 used the 32 round snail mag from World War I, but then the very common double stack single feed was introduced for the MP28 and copied by scads of people, most notably Britain, but many, many others too. Cheap to produce, better than the snail, but had an intrinsic flaw. The coffin mag was never really used by many people, but it's just fun and interesting and shows interesting ways of thinking. Then we get into the Beretta mag, which really inspired the Uzi mag, if not really just what they copied. So for that reason alone, it's worth it. These were also used later in Beretta's M12 submachine gun, which is introduced in the late 50s. The MP40 mag is the same as the Sten mag. It's a copy of the MP28 for all intents and purposes. This is a later version that has some grooves stamped into it for hopefully strength, but it had the same intrinsic flaws. The PPSH 41 is again a double feed, excuse me, a, a double stack single feed. You can tell the top. That was done so it would fit the magwell originally made for the drum mag. Durable mag, reasonably, very actually quite reliable. The 7.6-25 cartridge fed well for mags like that. But it was not as good as the PPS 43 mag, which is a double feed. This is a lighter weight magazine. It's also easier to load and it is more reliable. And kind of shows the future there. In a lot of ways, this kind of reminds me of what mag would later be used in the Kalashnikov. This is the Carl Gustav Trapezoidal 36 round mag, developed for use in the M45, although it came out after the submachine gun, and it would be copied by Finland, and would be very, very reliable, and an interesting shape to boot. Here is that overbuilt Mat 49 mag. Again, it's a version of the MP28, the Sten, but it would work much better because of generous tolerances. Interestingly, the grease gun mag would be about the same. Large 45, of course, but same basic uh, construction and style. Here's the Uzi mag. Now you can see how it's uh, similar to the... Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. The Beretta mag here, it's just the, the the dimples are different. This is a 30 round, this is a 25, but they're dimpled a little differently, but the mags are the same. In fact, earlier Uzi mags would even have the spine in the back. This is a later mag, so it does not, but the early ones would. Sturdy mag is really something all of its own. It does kind of resemble the body, the PPS 43 curved, but it's made very, very well and is really a class apart. In fact, even when Canada made their own version of the Sterling, they simplified it because it was just such a very good but labor-intensive mag. This is the second style of MP5 mag, the curve. The, other, the early ones were straight, as I said. 
It kind of looks like a Sterling mag, but again, simplified in a way. They did find that curved was just a good feed for the 9mm. Here is the Colt mag. As you see, it is quite similar to the Uzi. Body is identical, it just doesn't have these. And, and the mag catch is in a different place. Good enough mag, nothing extraordinarily. It had a few issues, but it worked pretty well. And finally, we have the Scorpions mag, a modern polymer critter. Like I said, it kind of reminds me of the MP5 mag. A little bit curved. These are inexpensive, reliable. They don't rust, they don't dent. They might crack, but at least you know, and they still usually work when cracked, at least for a while. Well, I tried to make it as brief as possible, guys. I know it was a long video. Appreciate you tuning in. If any of these interest you, please uh, you know, check out our detailed videos. The guns themselves, as I said at the beginning, were all semi-autos. Many of the unique ones were put together for me by MK Gun Mods, a friend over there. Some of the other stuff were imports. For example, the MP5 is a POF. The Scorpion, of course, is an original Scorpion. The Colt is a uh, AR-6450, which you've seen in a couple of our other videos. The Sterling is an original British uh, Mark VI pre-band import. Ditto for the Uzi. It's a Model A. It's uh, definitely a shooter grade, but the gun's damn nice. <laughs> and I really like it. The PPS-43 is one of the older I.O. imports from Poland. And the um, Suomi the KP-31 and the PPSH-41 are both builds done by TNW. I was very impressed with them. I think they made about the best PPSH-41 build commercially available in America. There were a lot of attempts before it. Well, this was a very kind of brief overview history of the submachine guns evolution. Really appreciate you tuning in. If you have any questions or comments, please post them. If you liked the video, please click like. If you haven't already subscribed and don't mind long, boring videos, please do so. And we do have a lot of short shooting videos too, so don't worry, they're not all like this. And we do have a video like this on the smokeless powder evolution and the evolution of the self-loading rifle as well. This is Misha, and we'll catch you very soon in another video. Thanks for tuning in.